Welcome back to the Lauren Valor Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Watson, and I am joined once again today by my friend and author of romance, space opera, hard science fiction, military science fiction, and alternate history extraordinaire, uh, Mona Lisa Foster. Thanks for joining me again today, Mona Lisa. I am so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm Great glad Friday. we're back. It, yeah, happy, happy Friday. Friday. We're, we're there. Um, so no, it's been uh, it's been kind of a hiatus. Just you know, nothing bad. Just day job, busy, busy with writing. We both got families to take care of, but we're glad to be back and glad to be talking about Shadow and Bone episode four again. Um, this show has been a surprise hit with me. I, I, I like it a lot better than I expected to. Eat, frankly, even given your recommendation, um, I was like, well, it's not my genre, but I'll give it a shot. But there are some things they're doing. Um, that uh, they put more effort into it than I would have expected them to. Um, and I'll get into that a little later. But uh, Mona Lisa, for you, uh, with episode four, kind of what stood out to you about this one? And uh, what what's kind of your favorite element of this part of the story? Um, the, the thing that struck me the most on this was the focus on their emotions. Um, I felt that this was very, uh, very much about their internal processes rather than the events in the story. So there was a lot of events as well, but mm -hmm. you could see that for them emotionally, this was just an emotionally intense episode. And there was that resonance that was being set up between the characters and it's it's just all emotions. And this is probably why I like this show more than it, why I'm willing to forgive a lot of, a, a lot of the stuff that I don't <laughs> like about it is because there's that emotional payoff uh, with mm -hmm. the characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so in a lot of their interactions, so the, the show, the heart of the show is still Lena Starkov, um, obviously is our heroine. Um, and with her interactions with the Kiergan, um, I, they're both, you know, especially the Kiergan is a really good actor and she's not bad either, but I really find myself hoping that his, his angst and vulnerability is not manufactured. Um, and I don't mean manufactured from a writing sense. I mean that the character is not purely deceiving Alina. I, I'm sure, uh, as sure as God made little green apples, I'm sure that he has layered motivations and not all of them are pure and some of them are Machiavellian. I just hope it's not entirely a falsehood uh, that he's portraying this angst and this burden of command that he he displays for her. Uh, you don't have to spoil it for me, but he's doing a good enough job that that occurs to me when he's... Uh, you know, at first when he takes her writing and they set up their pathos pretty well, or pathos, however you prefer to pronounce that, um, they set up their pathos pretty well and then they get into the exposition, but it's not too clunky because it's relevant to what they're talking about. Um, you know, and he's, you know, they're, they're kind, they're, they're doing a pretty good job establishing their relationship and their mutual vulnerability. And then her concern with being a pariah and his assurance that he won't, allow that to happen to her, uh, even though he's obviously worried about himself. I just hope that there's, that the, the character is complex enough that this is not just mustache twirling, like, aha, you fool. You know, like, I hope it's like, no, 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 I really mean that. I'm also just willing to do a bunch of heavy handed and dark shit if I need to, to win. <laughs> well, I, I think that's why he is such a relatable character for you. Um, mm. Because, he is about getting it done, doing the things you need to do to get it done. And um, that, that scene that they have at the well or the, the fountain where mm -hmm. they're talking and they're, we're getting this uh, backstory of the black, the black heretic and him being a descendant of the black heretic and, and having this guilt about it. Um, you realize that they really are more like than not, yet they're coming at this from two different directions. She wants to fit in. And he's mm. like, why? Why would you want to fit in? Yeah. And, and it's it's like, so they both come from similar things, yet they have come to completely different. They're, they're at different stages in their life. Yeah. Absolutely. Is what I think is happening. Yeah. No, I agree completely. And I do like, um, I mean, I don't know where the show will land, but I do like that the show is just flat out, uh, portraying that it's like, no, 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 you need to, whatever her relationship with Mal is going to be forward, going forward, it can't be dependency, you know, that she has too much emotional dependency on Mal, whether they remain friends or not, uh, whether he's a romantic rival for the Kiergan in the future, I don't know. 
Um, I could see that. I could see it staying platonic. I could see the writers going a different direction with it. Again, I, I'm not going to speculate too hard on that. But regardless, you know, she's very, you know, cranky female Yoda calls it out, you know, like drugs her to get her to face her own childhood hangups <laughs> with the team, which I thought that was a pretty fun scene. So, so Bagra, <laughs> female Yoda. Um, I really like her. Um, she is very much a Slavic teacher. And that that entire scene where she's hitting her and 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 is motivating her with a stick, mm -hmm. that is so Slavic in in, mm -hmm. in nature. I mean, you can tell that this. I don't know. I, I don't know if she did research or if she had personal experience with this kind of person, but all of that resonated with me. the The idea of a student only learning things because they it, because it's fun or because mm -hmm. it's easy or because um, you want to do it, Bakra doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you're <laughs> going to learn, I'm going to make it painful for you. And I don't care if you succeed or not. In fact, if you fail, this, this is just makes my life easier. So go ahead and give up, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you know, there's obviously a balance to be had, but I agree with you. Like, I, I really appreciate that Vagra, who, I, will try to to intermix her name with cranky female Yoda. But um, that Vagra, you know, embraces, you know, two principles of training that I learned from the time I was 18 onward, which is, you know, repetition and blunt trauma. Um, that, that those are valid. Now, it's not all you use, but frankly, it can get shit done. I really appreciate when uh, Elena is confiding to her courtier friends who are fellow Grishas, when she's like, she released a beehive on me. The worst part was it worked. You know, like, <laughs> I really like that. I could summon it will at that point. <laughs> well, I think people under, underestimate the, the, um, the efficacy of fear when it comes to learning. And uh, mm -hmm. Margaret does not. <laughs> Obviously, if she's releasing yeah. bees on people. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that, like, again, like, I, I don't want to sound, you know, like, I want to walk a line here. Because I'm like, yeah, no, kids need both, right? You need, mm -hmm. you need love, encouragement, and positive affirmation. You also need to learn how to operate under pressure, you know, like, because there's an entire universe, you know, I, I tell my kids frequently, it's like, listen, you're, you're in the safest environment you're ever going to be in. You know, we love you and we care about your feelings. There's an entire universe out there that doesn't. And while I care if you're hurting physically or emotionally, I want you to be able to cope with a world that won't, you know, largely. You'll find other people who care, obviously. But most of the people you deal with on the day to day won't really care. So, yeah, I push you. I put you under pressure to a certain extent, not because I'm trying to abuse you, but because you're going to have to deal with worse. Um, and I feel like Vagra is <laughs> a very fun, uh, tropey character, but a well-executed tropey character uh, in in that respect. I'm enjoying I'm enjoying Madam Hooch's appearance in this. <laughs> It's funny that you call her cranky female Yoda because she is the opposite of Yoda, right? Um, Yoda yeah. is like, feel the calm flow through you and mm -hmm. don't use anger and don't be afraid and that'll boost your power. Bhagavad mm -hmm. is the exact opposite. She wants you to embrace the dark side. She wants yeah. you to release your... She's a Sith. <laughs> yeah, she would very much be in the mold of the Sith. Uh, and I really love the... Um, I really love her, her ultimate fuck your feelings moment when she's like, well, how many orphans are you going to allow to be made while you're waiting around to be good enough to end this war? You right. know, like, and like, that's something I really appreciate because we, you know, in the privileged uh, West, we so often wring our hands about stuff. And I'm not saying, you know, that our problems are nothing, but we will often wring our hands about small stuff and forget what it's like to have, real problems, which you have some experience with, <laughs> you know, like that. It's like, don't forget that everything you're upset, not everything you're upset about, but a lot of the stuff you're upset about, you know, yeah. is it really a priority? You know, like, is it really a priority? Well, yes, it is. Cause it matters to me. Okay. Okay. But meanwhile, <laughs> you know, like meanwhile, some real shit is happening and there are people dealing with threats to their lives Mm -hmm. You know, and that sort of thing. And you're ignoring that because of because you want to feel good because you're worried about your friend from childhood, which th there's nothing wrong with friendship. Um, but I like I do 
one thing about this episode, this kind of segues into Mal's arc. Like I, they really do kind of subvert the friendship as magic pretty hard in here. Cause you know, Mal, the, like the opportunity comes out, you know, the Kyrgyz sends out word with Alina's own drawing of the stag. Um, I, I think it's uh, Morisova's stag. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. S sends out word with her drawing of the stag that, you know, he offers this great reward to any pathfinding team that can find it. He of course volunteers and that makes perfect sense with his motivation um, and then his friends back him up and you're like, oh, cool. His friends backed him up. Uh, it's not going to end in a heartwarming place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that was the thing when, when I, when I was first watching this is I had the same thought and I'm like, oh, dude, I really like them. Yeah. They're funny and they're, they're, they're actual really good friends. So yeah. she does that thing that mm -hmm. authors should be doing, which is that if, the things that happen to your character should be so bad that if they were to meet you in real life, they'd want to strangle you. Yeah. For all yeah, the bad that things pretty, that you did. Yeah. That was pretty rough. Uh, and for a YA show, I have to say, I, I have to give them some credit. Uh, it's not the focus of the show, but they're doing some of the army stuff better than some shows that that is their focus. You know, like it's not hyper realism by any means. I'm not saying it is, but I really appreciate the, uh, I know this is not, your, your wheelhouse, but like the action choreography for the most part, I'm like, Oh yeah, no Mal is taking the shortest route to kill the guy rather than like taking dramatic pauses or pausing for dialogue in the middle of a fight. You know, it's like, no, no, we just got ambushed and I'm going to stab this motherfucker as fast as I can. I tried to shoot him, but my gun missed, you know, like everything in the scene flows logically of like, yeah, no, that's what you should probably try to do next. Good job. Um, the only thing being at the very end when they're like, did we get them all? And they're just all standing really close together, back to back, standing upright in a world with guns. You know, it's like, that's the only, it's a nitpick, but I'm like, yeah, no, they would probably know, get low, get behind something. You know, we live in a world with guns. Don't wait around standing in the middle of a clearing. But overall, I was just, I was like, yeah, no, whoever choreographed this, I was like, they, they put more effort into it than I, than I would have expected by far. Um, so good job, guys. I'm beginning to wonder if some of their advisors for this are Polish military. Potentially. Um, I, I would have to go look, look at the, um, at the, mm -hmm. at the credits, but there were a lot of Polish or a lot of Slavic names coming up on, in the credits. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I, I do wonder, they just, they just got some really good advisors on this because yeah. I, um, the, the, these parts were not in the book. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. Was, yeah. So yeah, no, I, I, I appreciated that. And it is, it is rough, you know, I like it's like Mal is, you know, pure of heart and everything. And we even have him now embracing Arthurian myth. He's, he's chasing the white stag. I talked about that in the last episode and he leads his friends to their death. Um, it's like, ouch, that that's rough. And that totally can happen. And they dropped a very important clue in, in this episode um, with his, the, just the, the friend um, made one throwaway comment about mm -hmm. his ability to find things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's, it's almost the kind of thing that maybe you would miss if you haven't watched it two or three times already. <laughs> <laughs> like I did. Yeah. They don't lampshade it so hard that you can't miss it, which I always appreciate, you know, like it, it's an argument I've had um, a few different times with different people in our little circle of writers that it's like, oh, well, what if the reader misses it? And I'm like, well, make sure the story still makes sense if they miss it, but your observant reader will appreciate it so much more if you don't spoon feed it to them, you know, like, you know, for the people who you would have to like, be like, no, really, Mal's super good at tracking, like, you know, supernaturally good at track. It's like, okay, stop, you know, like let, let the viewer and the viewer who picks up on it will feel better because they picked up on it and you didn't treat them like a moron. Um, so that's one of my writing things is resist the urge to explain R U E. I see writers do this all the time. They will explain the same thing to you five, six, just to make sure you haven't missed it. Yeah, and, and, and I get the impulse. Like I, I get it. Mm -hmm. but, know, it but it yeah. it gets boring. Yeah, 
Yeah, and 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 if and I get you got to calibrate, right? Because not everyone is paying as close of attention as everyone else. So, you know, for the the lowest common denominator of attention, not intelligence, I'm not insulting anyone, but for the lowest common denominator of attention, hope like your story should still hold together. But for the people who pay attention, it's more enriching if you didn't, you know, like just spell everything out. Uh, and modern Hollywood is so guilty of of doing that. And that Shadow and Bone, for the most part, with some exceptions, doesn't. I feel like some of the stuff Kaz does falls into the like expositiony world building. Here are my abilities. Like I wouldn't really say this line of dialogue, but you need to know what I'm talking about. So here's this line of dialogue. As you know, um, Bob. <laughs> yeah. The as you know, Bob's. As you know, Bob. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I appreciated, like, I'm not actually, like, I, I, I do shoot recreationally, but I'm not much of a hunter. Um, but his tracking sequence, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's like, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's something as mundane as deer shit. But it's like, yeah, but it's unusual because there's so much of it in the middle of winter. And it's like, oh, huh, clever. Good job. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, like that. I have no clue if that would actually be something that would happen because we need her, but <laughs> but they see that part they needed to explain. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure somebody is cringing about it and going, "Oh, it doesn't matter if it's winter and this is supposed to be Finland yeah. or northern Russia or something." And yeah, they're not going. This the the sure. herd is going to be starving. Yeah, <laughs> details. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, and yeah, I guess it all matters where your line is, right? Because if you are an experienced hunter in cold weather climbs, maybe that scene is garbage to you. And full respect if it is, I have my own things that that stand out for me that don't stand out for the general audience. I get that. Um, but for, you know, someone who's vaguely familiar with it, I'm like, oh, solid reasoning. And I believe that his friends would, furthermore, solid reasoning. And I believe his friends might ask him that, you know, that yeah. it's not like that dialogue doesn't feel like, just so the viewer isn't lost, it feels like no, 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 that that makes sense. That that that's the conversation they have, and then them arguing about the magic deer shit. I like that too. And <laughs> I love like how he to sell it. Yes, yes, it's like oh, okay. Well, not only does he want to sell, he wants to split. You know, he asked his friend asked to split the the <laughs> the profits with him. The, the same guy who was just giving him shit about it. I'm like, I would have gone. No, you can't. Maybe ten percent, <laughs> not half. Yeah, no, it was funny. Um, yeah, I, I got a chuckle out of that scene. Um, and then they immediately subvert it by killing both of them. It was really sad, but not bad storytelling. Um, yeah. I do like that. Uh, I can only assume, so Mal's writing his letters to uh, Alina that are not getting through. I can only assume the Kiergan is having them intercepted to increase her emotional dependency on, on him. Uh, just, yeah. just a guess. Like, I mean, I, I feel like if it's not that, then whatever's actually happening better be really good. <laughs> well, I was. I, I have a note in here to talk about the letters um, as a storytelling device. Um, letters, um, in this case, voiceovers, are mm -hmm. a really great way to give us the characters' internal mental processes in a direct way. Um, mm -hmm. And if the letters would have gotten to each other they wouldn't have been as useful as a storytelling device. True. Very so, true. And, and we have a good story reason for why they don't. Yeah. Right. So I think that as long as you hit both of those things, that there's a good story reason and that, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. You're, you're having these letters there for a right reason that it can, it can work really great throughout the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, th and the way that they, they, they do some of the transitions in this, um, I, I don't remember what the technique is called now, but it's, it's, it's just, it really, they flow into each other. It doesn't feel like they're uh, violating anything by having them talk to each other, but in essence, they're talking to each other. So, mm -hmm. so we're getting this back and forth between them, even though they themselves aren't necessarily participants in the back and forth. You see what, I, mm -hmm. you see what I'm kind of trying to say? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get you. That, and that, that is interesting. Um, and while like maybe sometimes it lingers over much for my taste, it's not, I think it's appropriate for what the story is. Um, I don't think that's an objective criticism uh, that, that they're doing that too much. I, I do, I do think it's right. Um, 
So then, so yeah, I liked basically everything in both Mal's and Alina's plot line. Oh, I did uh, also appreciate the um, the fact, because I talked about the fact that uh, um, Vagra uses the hallucinogenic in Alina's tea. I actually like that as a, a tool to make the flashback flashback diegetic in this case, rather than just, you know, not that it's been bad that they've just had flashbacks to have flashbacks. But I was like, if they want to keep doing that, having it be organic to what's going on in the story right now, I thought was makes, makes it smoother than just saying, and here's a flashback. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, I like that storytelling element as well. I thought that was well done. Um, I agree. And uh, it again, it, it drove what she was trying to accomplish, which mm-hmm. was to get her angry enough uh, mm-hmm. b- because that eventually what she wanted happened. So all of a sudden, so she's barely, she's struggling to make this little ball of light Mm-hmm. And she she doesn't succeed until she has a great emotional upheaval. And the flashback fed into that. And then at the end, I mean, we're kind of skipping ahead. I know if it's okay. We don't have to go strictly chronological. I'm trying to get away from actually just recapping. Just talk about what's interesting in the episode. The, the way that she has uh, Genya come in and finally do the one thing that she asked her not to do, which was get rid of that scar. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a great emotional turning point. In fact, I think this may be the the halfway. This is the the big emotional. Are there eight episodes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It feels like that middle of the story where Mm -hmm. the the character stops reacting and starts Mm -hmm. being proactive. Yeah, the the second door in Campbell theory. I think like the there's like the two doors you enter and then. I, I'm not an, a Campbell expert, but I seem to remember something along those lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And like, furthermore, I even like, while it is very Sith of them, I, I was never purely Jedi myself. <laughs> I I think it's, you know, they're portraying it as this hardening of her, but I think it's even correct, you know, like that I'm like, she's even like, it's like, yeah, no, friendship is important, but so is duty and she's making the right choice. Like, you know, and, and like, I, like, I don't think we'll see where the show goes, but it's like, it's not like you aren't friends with Mal anymore. It's not like he doesn't matter. It's just that you have a job to do and you need to do it. And if your own emotions are getting in the way, you need to tame them, you know, or channel them differently. What's interesting here is that it seems that this magic system that they have, the operation of the magic is very emotional for them. Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. it's not it's not emotional just for the people that work on emotions. Uh, you know, her thing is light. So apparently it's all emotion dependent. Mm-hmm. And I think what with what this episode was about was her switching identities from somebody who wanted to be just like everybody else to accepting the fact that she's special. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true too. Um, and I think it was well done. Uh, again, this was show has been a surprise hit for me. I really enjoyed episode four. There was some stuff. Um, so Kaz, Jasper, and Inej, whose names I've managed to memorize by now. Um, I will say Jasper leaving the lamb with the barmaid with a little bullet necklace got an actual out loud chuckle from me. I was like, oh, that's funny. Good job, it was Jasper. For the goat. It was for the goat, right? Yeah, for, the, yeah, for, the, for the, goat, the baby goat. Yeah, I was like, okay, that was funny and cute. Um, <laughs> When they, when Jasper, they're like, oh, we need to pull a heist. And Jasper's like, yay, time for a heist. I'm like, I feel like maybe that dialogue was a little meta, that you're trying to get us excited for your heist plot. Um, and even though I know the, the they are a legitimate part of the story, and I know they're tied in, and they're going to affect things down the road, they still, compared to what's going on with Mal and what's going on with Alina, they feel a little bit more like filler for me in this episode, like, I know they're not, I know that like, I see where it's going, so I can't be fully critical, but I'm like, okay, you had a cutesy heist sequence where everything went right. So kind so of- I have, you, I have notes on that. I have notes <laughs> on that because I wanted to talk about it. So- Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So wh- what I was taught was that if you're going to discuss the plan, the plan cannot go off as you discussed it. You can talk about it all you want, but you better have a second plan that you're actually going to have happen in the story because yeah. things have to go wrong. And um, I was I was expecting more things to go wrong on this too. 
what was interesting was the back and forth they did with the time change on this because mm -hmm. it's, they they start by talking about the plan and then they have the plan up on the on the screen as it's it, as it's as it's coming out and there's that one sequence where Inej lowers herself in there and she's she's like behind the guard mm -hmm. and she's she, he, he doesn't know that she's there and mm -hmm. i think people forget about the sense of smell they all and, and movie makers are very much guilty of, of this. I mm -hmm. mean, even if we assume that she has had a, a bath, she would smell of soap. Um, mm -hmm. You're not going to have unscented soap. Soap mm -hmm. has its own smell, even if it's unscented, right? You don't add anything to it. Mm -hmm. And if if she's climbed up to the the big tower and and lowered herself in through the ceiling, she's been sweating, and he can't smell her at all. I mean, what is yeah. she doing to hide her scent? Um, yeah. You know, what if, yeah. what if, what, whatever she had to eat earlier. So, mm -hmm. movie makers have this one advantage that that we just that well, people forget about the sense of smell. And I thought that would have been if you wanted to have something wrong here, that would have been mm -hmm. the thing that you could have really written in there to go well, wrong. I'll uh, yeah, that 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 would definitely be a thing. And I'll pick the thing that broke my immersion a bit, even though this is fantasy world. And you can probably you might be able to guess, but like the bell covering the gunshot, my ass, <laughs> like, like my ass. No, it wouldn't. Shut up. Like, and I get it. Like Jasper's gunplay is magical, so they get to break rules with it. But I was like, okay, sure. Sounds or, good. Um, and also, that's not going to raise any alarms that someone shot their lock open. They're not going to not going to run into. I mean, and if they run in to increase security next time, that's fine. Uh, and then the one thing it's, I, I think this is actually a positive for me. Kaz's costume and persona when he goes to get the uh, uh, the tries to get the the what was he doing the the measurement on the doors for the palace from the the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. I did get a chuckle because I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is an intentional homage to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when Harrison Ford pretends to be a Scottish lord <laughs> like to get into the Brunvald castle. Yeah. Like, I, I, I was like, OK, that that was fun. I'll give you that well, one. Well, thank you very much for that. Now I know what I'm watching for the next three nights. Uh <laughs> Of course, no, I, emphasis I, on three nights because there are only three Indiana Jones movies. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know it. Um, so, and, and I, ha I had kind of the same thoughts. I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. and then the way that he made that copy or that she made that copy with, with, or well, no, it was Kaz that made the copy with the, mm -hmm. with the spray. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, oh, having had to use that technique in art class, <laughs> it doesn't work like that, but okay. All right. It's whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Like it was just. I mean, like, it's kind of, they wanted the heist plot, but they didn't want to dedicate an episode to it as mm -hmm. an A plot. So, okay. Like, was it, did it feel a little too easy? Did it feel a little, little fillery? Yeah, it did. Um, but eh, I wasn't mad while I was watching it. So I'll, I'll give him a pass. Um, I don't even mind that Inej can magically still do Cirque Soleil as if she's been practicing for, for a while. <laughs> like that's, the, that's their, their convenience to get into the palace is there are going to be circus performers. <laughs> yeah. And um, her doing that kind of ties into that whole thing of, Oh, okay. She's this female assassin and she has all this skill set. So where did, where did it come from? So did it come from because she trained as a circus performer and mm -hmm. that's why she's so good at what she does. It kind of, they don't explain it, but they're, you know, it, it's it kind of makes sense. Yeah, and then the like, so so when you play D and D, right? Um, bear with me; it's relevant. Yeah, it's so fine. When you, when you play an, an RPG, generally speaking, you have your 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 power your power trio or your five man band uh, to use storytelling, and like everyone has their silo, and within your silo, even if in the real world your character wouldn't have that cross specialization, it's like, well, you're the science guy, so you know, biology as well as, you know, physics, because you're the science guy. <laughs> like, like, likewise, it's like, oh, well, you're the agile assassin trope character. So even if I don't know why your culture's ninjas do Cirque du Soleil rope tricks, 
I'm, uh, it's okay. By Tropes of Fantasy, I understand that you can do Cirque du Soleil. It's fine. Um, uh, yeah. The fact that you're still good at it after years without doing it, that's fine too. It's okay. The thing that really gets to me is I'm like, they're going to let a dude with a revolver into a palace with a king who's not one of the guards. Okay. <laughs> like, if you say so. Okay. Not, not, not so magically good marksman, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, th this is one of my problems with YA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not only do we have the one. It seems like everybody in their little circle of friends is special too. It's like they're superheroes, right? You've got the main yeah. superhero and then you've got the auxiliary superheroes. And it has that feel of Inej is the acrobat slash assassin superhero. And then apparently they're setting up Jasper to be some sort of special. Okay. No matter how much I trust you, I'm not going to let you shoot at me. <laughs> Especially... Like a card in your, okay, over yeah. your shoulder. Okay. Just not going to happen. <laughs> so yeah. it was one of those, oh, that was one of my eye roll moments too. I'm like, mm. okay, sure. <laughs> but I can forgive him because he was nice to goats. He was very nice to the goat. And then he, when he's talking about how much he misses the goat, they're telling him to shut up. That's pretty fun. And that whole um, thing was set up by the conductor who they sent out at the beginning to go do something, basically get us in, into the palace. So the poor girl, he, uh, yeah. the poor performer he dropped. That guy's not very nice. No, no, he's <laughs> not. No. Um, but yeah, even even the the call it the C plot now, because we have Alina and Mal, and I think they're A and B. Uh, respectively, even the C plot still enjoyable, even though it's the easiest thing to poke holes in, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in the show so far. Um, oh, um, Nina on the slave ship. Uh, I had not put, I think I hadn't put together that she was working for the Kiergan on my own uh, until this episode. I don't think that I put together that she, because Kaz was looking for her, I had assumed she was actually a free agent. I didn't know that she was on a covert mission. I was surprised to hear that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I, I, what is it? What is it? It's MacGuffin. Yeah. Mac something to distract. It's mm -hmm. uh, that's, I got a lesson in what a MacGuffin was at FenCon this weekend because we used it wrong <laughs> in a panel and Tony uh, was in the audience. Oh and, uh, yeah. And Tony's like, you guys are all using MacGuffin wrong. And I'm like, mm. okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I thought that Nina was a distraction all along. Mm, mm -hmm. And, um, but not, I, I didn't quite have it figured out exactly how she was being used as a distraction. Mm. There wasn't a lot of Nina and, well, I don't remember his name now. Um, the Fjordan, the guard, the guard yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah I, I'm just calling him the guard. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. So what you've got with Nina on this is that typical of how a female character should be written. To the mm -hmm. point where, okay, she does some things that just to be defiant because she has to be defiant. Um, and while I get that maybe she would wonder if it was poisoned, once he tastes it, that kind of proves that it's not poisoned. And if you've been tied up hanging from the ceiling for a while and not fed, I'm thinking you would probably eat it. I mean, I don't know Nina's full background, so maybe she's had the equivalent of Ravikin Seer School, so she is, like, tougher than she looks and has been subject to sleep deprivation, food deprivation, torture, things of that nature can resist it, so maybe it would work, but I've been without food for a couple days at a time, and let me tell you, it is really hard to, and not, I've never been chained to a wall um, in a freezing and starving to death in a slave ship. So the, <laughs> I haven't yeah. done that. But even just going without food for a couple of days normally, you tend to be pretty tempted by it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, yet they have her get all up in his face about it. And yeah. they never have her attempt to manipulate him. Mm. I mm. would have thought that they would have had something like, hey, sailor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. no. Yeah. 
Um, one would think, and like, I mean, I do appreciate they're trying to go for the, oh, these are two good people put pitted against each other by circumstances when in reality they should not be enemies, which is, it's fine. It's a perfectly serviceable trope, but it's, it's now your D plot. So you're not getting a lot of time with it. Um, I do like that. Uh, um, I find it interesting. I probably use the term interesting and like too often in these. I'll have to work on that. But the part where the captain or the first mate, whoever it was, is like, oh, if the storm gets real bad, kill the prisoners. And he's like, no, they're bound over for trial. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the problem when you use lawful neutral or lawful good aligned minions. Eventually, you push them too far um, when you want to do evil shit. So <laughs> I thought his questions to her, the things that she that he was trying to get her to explain to him were very interesting because he's supposed to be this Grisha hunter, yet he has left room inside of his thought processes to wonder if what he has been told about them is actually true. He he doesn't even know if they were born Grisha or if they chose it. Yeah. And I honestly, if I would have been the one who'd been tied up and, and held prisoner, I would lie to him if necessary to get him mm -hmm. to do what I, you know, to be on my side. And mm -hmm. I was really surprised that she, she again, she just kind of gets in his face about it. And mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, she's yeah. So, yeah. unless she's unless she's so manipulative, I'm not saying this is the case. Unless she's so manipulative that she realizes that that is what will turn him in the long run is the more flagrant, and she, and open, honest approach. Like, who knows? Yeah, and she, she might be. She's supposed to be. What is it? Heart render. She's a, yeah. yeah she's, okay. So even mm -hmm. though she can't use her hands, maybe she has some way of reading people and and knows just what to say. But if that's the case, we don't know that. So yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering what it is that if, if this is part of her personality or if this is the writers making her a certain type of strong female character or if it's, yeah. If she has to their movie. credit, they have not been overdoing that. I, I don't feel like I agree. Anyone's a, no one's a true Mary Sue or anything. No one, no one has had me rolling my eyes in a way that Ray Skywalker yes. makes me roll my eyes. Yeah, no I, no, I agree. And that's one of the reasons I like this show. I didn't feel like that was being uh, shoved down my throat. And I thought this this particular character just is very interesting because I'm trying to figure out why she's acting the way that she is sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, that covers most of what I had for the episode. Is there anything else you kind of want to touch on before we start closing out? No, I I thought it was a very good episode overall. It moved the story along. It was great turning points, lots of emotional intensity. It was it was good. It's like, yeah, I would keep watching. In fact, I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will. So awesome. Awesome. So before we uh, leave for the day, Mona Lisa, I, I will actually say, uh, how much can I talk about what I've alpha read for you? Like, do you want me to say, can I say anything about it? Or do you want me to sure, just- you can, you can say, you can say anything okay. about it. If I object, you can cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We're not doing this live. So I got to read uh, Desperately Needs a Title by Mona Lisa Foster. <laughs> I got to alpha read it. So um, I love your latest work. It's one of my favorite things I've read in a, in a favorite new things I've read in a long time. Um, Thank you. So uh, I, I hope it sees success. Uh, where you're sending it for a home. Me too. So, am I being vague enough? <laughs> um, sure, uh, yeah, that, that works. Yeah, that works. Desperately but, uh, needs a title, needs a yeah, home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it is, it, the premise is okay to talk a little bit about, yeah. no spoilers. So no spoilers. El Dorado on the final frontier, um, the colony world with some samurai overtones. So well done. You're painting with so many awesome colors. Um, and while I love the movie El Dorado, it's maybe my favorite John Wayne movie. I love the depth you're able to give the characters over what there is in El Dorado. So I cannot wait to see uh, that that project um, advance. Uh, and I, I, I hope uh, the where you've submitted it loves it as much as I do, so we can see it in in a, in a nice new edition soon. Uh, but beyond that, so I know I know what you've been working on. Uh, what's out now, what's out next, and what would you like? where would you like the people to look for your work? Um, they can go to my website, monalisafoster.com. Um, my books are available everywhere. Um, and one of them looks the first one in which way? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There we go. Um, 
I have a short story that's coming out. We actually got to see the cover for the Ross 248 project, which is what it's called. It's an anthology that's being edited by Les Johnson and Ken Roy. That we sounds like got... a Les Johnson anthology. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> we got to see the cover at FenCon. Nice. 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 It's, and and uh, it's red, which is yeah. my favorite color. Oh, very um, cool. So I have a short story in that that... Um, Les Johnson said, blew him away. And yeah, I, I was very, very surprised by that because I had to submit a story proposal. So he should not have been surprised by anything in the story because um, he made me give him an outline. <laughs> <laughs> Which you love doing. I know you're a Which, natural outliner. Yeah, I just, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, well, so I'm not is, just, Go ahead, go ahead. No, go on. No, no, I was going to say, what's funny about that is I, I consider myself an outliner, but halfway through the book, the book does not look like the outline. <laughs> you know, like I'm working, what I'm working on right now, I did a pretty detailed outline for it. But once I get to know the characters better, it's like, oh no, actually that's not what's going to happen. Uh, you yeah. know, the end point usually stays about the same, but you know, I'm like, nah, that's not how they get there. Never mind, We're doing something else. <laughs> and since you brought that up, I was writing a, a Substack post this morning about pantsing versus outlining, mm -hmm. and uh, using that that book that you recommended to try to outline or flesh out a story ahead of time, mm -hmm. uh, which I might put up there. So, mm -hmm. um, but as far as my work, that's I, the only really the only things that I have coming out that I know of right now is the is the short story in the Ross Two Forty Eight project, and then mm -hmm. if things go right, eventually something else. <laughs> But, uh, you can, you know, you can find my stuff in at bookstores and libraries and online, and and um, uh, I also have a, a Substack thing that I'm that I'm doing now. It's yeah. mostly, mostly geared for for writers, but uh, yeah. there's there's going to be other stuff in there about uh, life in Romania and you know coming yeah. to the United States and stuff like that. Yeah, and even if you're not a science fiction fan, I highly recommend you read uh, Mona Lisa's writings about life in Romania because the odds are that, like me, you don't have a full appreciation for what life was like behind the Iron Curtain um, before the fall of communism. And I think every American should read what Mona Lisa has to write or at least what, what the actual survivors of communism have to say about it. Um, it might be an inoculation against a lot of bad ideas. Um, and that's as political as I will ever get on YouTube. Sorry, guys, I'm not going to lie about what I believe. Uh, links to all of that will be in the comments below, or in the, not the comments, the liner notes below. Uh, Mom Lisa, thank you so much for joining me again today. Glad to be back uh, recording these again. It's so much fun. Um, thank you. Again, I'm not saying I started this channel for an excuse to talk to my friends more more frequently, but it is a nice benefit of it. <laughs> well, we love being here. Yeah. Uh, so that is all the time we have for the Lauren Valor podcast today. Thanks so much for uh, watching or listening. Uh, if you would be so kind as to leave us a like, a subscribe, maybe a comment for the algorithms. If you think we were off base on anything, uh, please let us know. Uh, oh, we did have a comment. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, but last time somebody commented that Jasper's abilities will be like his ability to kill the rift creatures would be better explained. So I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to seeing that explanation. Sorry, uh, anonymous person whose name I can't remember who commented. I apologize. I'll, I'll be a better YouTuber next time and actually look that up before we record. Um, so anyway, that is all the time we have. Thank you for joining us in the Laura Valor podcast. Hope to see you next time. And until then, 